thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. So I'm going to get started right away. Uh, this is going to be a high level um, introduction of the capabilities that FRA has uh, in, its, in its inspection fleet and also a very high level, um, um, some high level thoughts on what we're doing um, to take the data that can come from uh, these inspection system um, and uh, start doing some predictive reporting and um, and my thoughts on what what are uh, what I presume are are the big challenges uh, with this. So I'm going to start with the uh, uh, DOTX 220-218. This is FRA uh, <clears throat> inspection consist. It's two cars uh, coupled together, and uh, it's basically a a comprehensive inspection platform that um, offers. Uh, a variety of, of data that allows us to uh, look beyond track geometry and <clears throat> and literally describe the conditions of the track and the various components and parts of the track along with the track geometry. So track geometry and rail profile is a stand standard uh, measurement systems that are on the car. Uh, we also have a gauge restraint measurement system. Um, there's a ride quality measurement system a right away and uh, roadbed imaging system, uh, a GPR, uh, a vertical track deflection system, uh, LIDAR, and a joint bar inspection system with RSIS, that's rail surface imaging uh, system, and, um, <clears throat> and a track component imaging system. So these, these last three systems are machine vision based. Um, this is, uh, this is a view uh, from the uh, uh, operator station inside of the uh, 220 car there. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about each of those systems or, or some of those systems. I'm going to skip the track geometry and row profile. We heard a lot about those yesterday. So I'm going to touch on, on, the, on the GRMS system. Uh, the GRS, GRMS system, um, includes two beams, two gauge beams, loaded and unloaded beams, and a fifth, ax fifth axle that allows us to apply a consistent nominal load, uh, ver both vertical and, and lateral under standard, standard testing operations. Um, uh, we apply L over V about 0.7 on, on track while testing. And the, the system produces <clears throat> two indices, uh, uh, one is gauge widening projection, which is a uh, indication of lateral track strength, and a projected loadal gauge, which is a which is a gauge measurement that's or, or it's an estimation of what the gauge would be under some extreme uh, loading conditions. So this this system allows us to um, to obtain a performance-based assessment of, of tie and, and fastening systems. Um, the other system I'm gonna uh, talk about about is uh, the joint bar inspection system. This is a, a, a machine vision-based system that allows us to identify um, uh, cracks and joints, um, missing bolt, uh, loose and missing bolts and strip joints and, um, and things like that. Uh, the track component, Inspection system. It's again a machine vision system that looks at the uh, the conditions of the ties and um, and components um, uh, of the the tie and uh, rail seat interface or or tie and rail interface. So um, we're looking at the conditions of the ties, um, fasteners, tie plates, anchors, and and so forth. Uh, the LIDAR on the car is primarily used for um, assessment of, of grade crossings, uh, but it, um, it can be and it is, it is used for, for other purposes as well. Um, obstructions in, in the profile, um, uh, ballast profile, and, um, and so forth. The newest system on the car is the rail surface imaging system. It's actually located on the same beam as the joint bar system, and um, <clears throat> it looks at the surface of the rail and um, and assesses the the surface damage uh, on the rail. 
the system divides the rail surface into uh, four bands and um, a, a machine vision algorithm um, calculates uh, the calculates the uh, parameters that uh, describe the condition of the surface of the rail for these bands individually. So we're basically converting the um, the uh, the surface damage into foot by foot data. Uh, uh, some of the parameters that we calculate are are crack angle, crack density, um, uh, surface surface damage. Uh, um, condition and and so forth. Um, there is um, uh, grinding detec detection included in the algorithm. Um, um. <clears throat> these are some these are some uh, example images from the from the system um, as they come in. The next, uh, the other system, the next system is a vertical deflection system. This this system was developed by the uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln uh, under the grant from FRA, and it was commercialized by MRL and and, and Harsco. And what this system does is is it measures a component of the total vertical deflection. It's it's basically a um, Basically, a slope of the of the uh, deflection basin over uh, four feet, and that measurement actually within itself includes um, um, a component of, of unloaded um, geometry. But uh, that that component can be eliminated from the measurement when installed on a car uh, with track geometry, and we can calculate a, an end core offset from from the geometry system. Uh, to basically remove the geometry component from the from the deflection and and, and get the deflection um, itself. Um, the ground penetrating radar on the FRA car was was provided by uh, Zedica. The 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 GPR produces several um, metrics that that characterize the uh, <clears throat> the the track. Uh, the latest development there is that we are able to uh, uh, process the data in real time, and uh, the processing is actually triggered by um, by the geometry system. So um, the GPR uh, turns on uh, processing, so it collects data continuously, but the raw data is being processed in real time around specific geometry deviations in in real time. <clears throat> so. That was uh, that was the high level of the of the most comprehensive um, uh, vehicle in the FRA fleet. There's other manned cars um, in the in in the fleet, and other than the manned car, uh, the FRA also has um, um, a couple of high rail inspection vehicles. Those are very good for uh, getting to places that the the full size or autonomous cars won't get so to yards or to short lines and and things like that. And uh, then the FRA has two uh, autonomous uh, geometry box cars. Um, it also has a, um, a car, so it has a third autonomous system that that uh, uh, can basically operate both in in manned and unmanned mode. So that's not a box car, but there's two box cars that uh, <clears throat> the FRA uses um, to um, uh, uh, to inspect track. And the, the autonomous systems um, <clears throat> have, um, of course, a, a great advantage of being able to um, produce uh, frequent measurements and, and consistent measurements. And, and, and those measurements then can be um, used to uh, really get insight into uh, long-term trends, uh, degradation, and, and used for uh, predicting the future behavior of the track. Um, one of the boxcars were was used um, for the ballast waiver study, and this is an example of some of the uh, geometry trends that were identified there. Um, here we have, I think, roughly a year and a half, um, uh, or actually even more than that, um, uh, worth of worth of data, and we can clearly see the the trends and uh, the. Um, uh, the maintenance events 
within those, um, those geometry trends. Um, but how to do that on a large, large scale? I think it was said here yesterday that um, you know, doing trending and predictive reporting um, on a single subdivision and, uh, and the entire network are, are two different um, animals. So one of, the, one of the efforts that we're working on with FRA is, is to uh, develop a whole framework and architecture to actually accommodate this uh, predictive uh, reporting. And I'm just going to say that um, the, there are several pieces um, in this process that I believe are the most challenging and mo most important for, um, uh, for any meaningful uh, predictive reporting. And those are um, here on the left side of, of, uh, of, of that process. And, and that's basically uh, have to do with data management, how we, <clears throat> how we manage the data in the, in the databases, how we clean the data so they come into the previous process in the, in the best shape possible and any spike or any erroneous sig signals don't contaminate the, the trending and the predictions. And then how we make sure that we actually are trending data from the right places, that we are on the right track, the data is, is aligned uh, correctly. Uh, those are, I think, th those are the most uh, important and challenging uh, pieces of, of this. The actual trending algorithms uh, and, and forecasting algorithms, I believe, are actually the, the easy part. But, uh, you know, the, uh, having the data ready for this, that's, that's the foundation with, uh, where it uh, stands, stands on. Um, so we already st uh, started addressing those 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 pieces. <clears throat> so the um, uh, one of the crucial ones is data alignment. Our approach is is to um, basically go um, an extra step from um, a track determination into what we call a feature ID determination. It's basically track segments between control points, and uh, as the as the individual cars run across the track, you know they can switch from from track to track. So, what we do is we break up the the, the runs into individual segments, and then place them on top of the base maps based on these individual segments and and align them. Um, so you can you can see here there were two runs that uh, diverged in the turnout, and uh, this this segment here. Um, this this new survey is divided into two, and uh, uh, this portion here would be aligned on the underlying survey, and this portion here actually would become a baseline uh, for this new uh, new segment. the The alignment uh, looks very good. It ha it has actually uh, two steps. Um, it uh, it uses GPS to get a rough alignment, and then um, um, and then in the second step in the final alignment is a statistical um, approach to, to move the data and align it as, as best as possible, including stretching and shrinking the data to account for, for encoder uh, calibrations. So it's, it's, a pretty, um, um, it's a pretty complex um, process. And, and of course, the performance of this is, is um, very dependent on the quality of the initial you know, track and feature ID assignment uh, as, as it comes in. The other, the other piece that we looked at is the data filtering. Um, so those that work with track geometry, they know that there is a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of signatures that, uh, that do not really represent the, the track, especially around, um, around turnouts, uh, spikes in turnouts, but also, you know, spikes due to to just the performance of the system, sun spikes and, and others. So I have some, I have some uh, examples here how we addressed it with with a filter we developed. It's a robust statistic filter. Um, it's an actually a combination of several filters that uh, that run in 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 um, consecutively on the results of the previous ones. Uh, the main component is a is a Hempel uh, filter and then the lowest smoothing filter. Uh, and this filter basically uh, first looks for um, outliers, and then uh, it act applies its smoothing portion of itself just on a on a on a certain window 
around this outlier. So we're trying not to manipulate, you know, all the data, only the data around this, around certain outliers. And uh, as you can see, the, the the filter performs very very well. Uh, it, it is individually, so it's actually a set of many filters. Uh, the basically each channel has its own filter setting and uh, uh, to to have uh, the best performance. Um, and um, I I put this here. This is actually um, I think about 90, 90 consec uh, consecutive surveys around. Um, uh, around a um, or through a turnout, and you can see um, here uh, in between those two lines when we look for uh, for peak geometry deviation. So this 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 top plot here is the peak uh, gauge deviation in in this area between the two vertical lines. You can see that it's all over the place. We're we're picking up the basically the the spikes um, uh, from from the gate system. So we don't really know what's what's going on. We couldn't trend anything here. But after we um, run the um, surveys through the Hempel Lois filter, you can see that all the spikes are removed and and the trend in in gauge is is revealed. So here it's a, a fairly stable gauge in the turnout, just a, a very very slight. Uh, degradation there. So uh, this filter has been working very well for us. It, it really did <clears throat> allow us to apply the trending and predicting even around turnouts and, and locations where the geometry usually is, is, is not as good. So when we have the infrastructure in place, when, when we have the, the data aligned and, and cleaned, it, it is ready for um, the actual uh, predicting algorithms. We we worked on um, several different approaches. You can you can use um, many different statistical ways to trend the data and 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 predict it. Different regressions, linear nonlinear regressions. One of the things that that we uh, started looking at is um, autoregressive models to start predicting. The actual entire foot by foot geometry for the future, and for that we uh, we tried various Arima and, and and Sarima models. We actually ended up using a Sarimex model, Sarimex, which um, the X there stands for um, exogenous uh, variables, um, and that allows us to actually enter other parameters into the prediction to um, to increase the the accuracy. Here's an example of the performance there. So on the on the top plot here, so we had a um, we had 25, 25 surveys that were used as as the training set. Um, or basically, you can for these autoregressive models, it's it's like a moving window. You have a set of of previous um, uh, surveys. And the algorithm goes through the surveys and learns the pattern and then predicts forward. So based on 25 um, previous surveys, um, we uh, we predicted uh, what the geometry would look like. And here it's it's actually overlaid with the real survey that was taken uh, at the same time that the prediction was for. And and for for three weeks ahead, the the predictions up to about three weeks a month, the predictions are are very good. Obviously, when we start predicting uh, much farther ahead, the the accuracy uh, goes uh, goes down. And here, I think we have um, some maintenance as well. And when I talk about maintenance, um, that's that's one of the exogenous variables that goes into these prediction models. So one one is is maintenance events. There's two ways that we incorporate these. Uh, one is a, a direct integration with the railroad um, um, system that can pull the information about where the maintenance uh, was and assign these to uh, the particular times. So the algorithm uh, basically discards the, the previous surveys from, from, uh, from the trend um, or where that information is not available. Uh, we look at um, um, or we use uh, we use some statistics to um, to detect these maintenance events from from the trends themselves. Uh, so that's 
that's basically the first one we uh, um, we incorporate. But there's many others that that can be incorporated, and kind of that kind of uh, take me to the uh, full circle here. So um, the um, going forward and and predicting the future geometry. Obviously, each each location is uh, on track is is unique, and there's there's various different uh, parameters and conditions that go into what, what the trend in the future will be and how the track responds and and behaves. It's track track alignment, the component type, its condition, what's the ballast conditions, also seasonality, and and a lot of these can be uh, assessed by. Uh, the other systems uh, that are on the car that I went through on the on the man car, the machine vision based systems, the the GRMS um, and so forth, and so that's our next steps is to start incorporating other exogenous exogenous variables into the into the predictions. Obviously, a uh, lot of the challenge with that is that unlike geometry that is now uh, a system that's autonomous and it's being deployed across the country and, and produces a very frequent measurements. Some of these other other systems like like GRMS or, or the machine, machine vision systems are not autonomous and, and the frequency of those is, is of course not as um, uh, not as high as geometry. But I think the, the future is, is uh, moving in the direction of making more and more systems autonomous and and get more and more uh, measurements um, from these as well. So that's all I had. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Question? Anybody have a question for Dan? Okay. The, uh, uh, the filter actually uh, works very well. It gives you an information it's doing. So, so there is a trend. So, so that's been ground truth. The, the results of the filter <laughs> you can and track and actually measure that data? No, 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 no. Okay. What is the truth? Well, the search for absolute truth is an absolute, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks for them.